right, guys, welcome back to Zoo School Live. Um, third time's a charm, hopefully. Um, thanks for sticking with us, guys, as we uh, try to figure out some of our technical difficulties that we're having. Um, but again, um, thank you guys so much for those of you who are uh, supporting us by watching Zoo School Live um, and for hanging out and uh, to, and uh, jumping back in if you guys are avid Zoo School Live watchers. Um, so if you are, you may notice our uh, uh, returning friend today. So again, my name is Educator Marissa, and welcome back to Zoo School Live. And um, today we're gonna be meeting two of our very turtly cool friends. Um, and so we're gonna be meeting Dude the Box Turtle, who I have here um, in this box, as well as Scooter, who we're gonna be meeting a little later on in our episode. So uh, today we're gonna be talking a little bit about what some of our native reptiles do in the winter time. So here, now that we're in the midst of January, we're getting to some of our colder months. Um, and you know, some of our reptiles are here with us, right? They're hanging out in Pennsylvania during some of the coldest winter months um, and the coldest days of the year. Um, which we're gonna be hitting in Pennsylvania, I think maybe this week. So um, he, we're gonna talk a little bit about what those reptiles are doing uh, and um, what you can do to help. So here um, we uh, have Dude in here and you might not be able to see him quite yet because he is doing what turtles do best in the winter time. Um, and that is hunkering down for the cold temperatures. Um, so Dude is actually snuggled in under these leaves here. And there he is. This here is our friend Dude. He is in fact an Eastern box turtle. So these guys are native to Pennsylvania and they're one of many native species that we have here in PA. Now, he is really one of the only uh, land dwelling turtles that we have here in Pennsylvania turtles are um, mostly aquatic, um, but due to box turtle really prefers to live on land. So although he can live near water, our friend dude is going to be time um, on land. And so that's really important when it comes to winter time. So um, during the winter, dude here is going to stay toasty, turtly warm um, by hunkering down in the dirt. Um, and so that might mean under leaves and he's gonna dig into the ground a little bit. And he doesn't need to dig up for full burrow to stay warm. Um, so he'll dig kind of the part of his body underneath the dirt um, and then he's probably going to try to hide under brush because believe it or not, leaves, particularly um, fallen leaves on the forest floor, make a really excellent insulator. Um, so that's what's going to help um, generate heat. So the larger a pile of leaves is, the more it's gonna generate warmth underneath there for some of our, our turtle species and some of our other reptiles here in Pennsylvania. Um, so dude here is gonna spend his winters staying put, right? So animals do a variety of things during the winter time. Um, they can either migrate, hibernate, or adapt, right? And so us as humans are really excellent at adapting, right? We are really great at putting on winter coats and putting on fleece lined pants and fuzzy socks, right? And all those things are gonna keep us toasty warm in the winter time. We're also really great at building fires, right? And, uh, you know, sitting by a fireplace and, um, you know, or sitting indoors where we can, uh, you know, even though we can um, generate our own heat as well, we kind of rely on some of those man-made heat to help us uh, really stay nice and toasty warm during the coldest winter months. Now, some lots of birds, right, will migrate south for the winter time, and some birds will fly just absolutely thousands of miles to go and to migrate to different areas. Um, now, here in Pennsylvania, one of the birds that actually migrates to Pennsylvania for winter time, and maybe even further south, is the snowy owl. Um, so we have had uh, previous episodes of our snowy owl here on Zoo School Live, and if you want to go back and watch that, um, you can check it out on our YouTube page. Um, but snowy owls don't typically reside in Pennsylvania. They actually live mostly up in the Arctic um, in the much northern north hemisphere of the United of, um, of the world, right? And so snowy owls will actually migrate south, as far south as Pennsylvania, and maybe even a little bit further. Um, and that's where they'll kind of stay for the winter months when it gets a little even too cold for them up in the Arctic. Now, some animals don't have the ability to wear winter coats or to um, to be able to travel far. As you can see, our friend Dude here is a pretty small guy, right? Even if he were to truck it down to Florida, he probably wouldn't make it in time. By the time he got all the way down to Florida, even if he left in October, it would probably be June 
again. So for our friend dude here, he's going to spend his winter months here in Pennsylvania, as do all of the reptiles that live here in PA. Um, we have over 20 different kinds of snakes. We have um, about 14 different kinds of turtles. Um, and we have a few lizards as well here in Pennsylvania. And now all these guys will hunker down for the winter time and they will go into something that we call brumation. Um, and that is a basically a kind of hibernation for reptiles and amphibians. So for these guys, they're going to just kind of hunker down, remember under leaves or brush or in the dirt. Um, box turtles uh, mostly spend their time in uh, wooded environments, right? Or forest environments. So these guys are gonna live maybe near creeks or streams, but they're really gonna live where there's a lot of trees um, and that's really beneficial come winter time, right? Because particularly in Pennsylvania, we have a wide variety of deciduous trees or trees that will actually lose their leaves uh, come fall and winter time. And when those leaves fall on the ground, that provides a perfect insulator on the forest floor for so many of our, our animals that live here during the winter time. So what dude's gonna do is he's gonna kind of dig in underneath all that brush and he is going to be able to kind of slow his body down. And so for dude, here he's gonna close up his shell he's going to be able to curl up um, and basically take a nice long nap throughout the winter time um, and he's able to do that by just slowing his body down um, so that means he can slow his heart feel your heartbeat at home right and about you know in the 60s 70s 80s you know uh, times if his heart only beats four times a minute that's okay. So he can slow his body way down and that's going to help him survive those cold winter months because then his body's not working as hard to keep him, uh, to keep him warm or to go out looking for food. Um, and he's going to spend those months just kind of hanging out waiting. So come about October and early November, box turtles are going to start eating and they are going to munch up all kinds of worms and delicious foods. Box turtles are actually omnivores. So they're going to spend a lot of their time munching up lots of bugs and also plant material. And they're gonna eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And then they'll start to they'll start to kind of hunker down and hibernate, right? Or brooming throughout the winter time. And then about March, when it starts to start raining again, spring is on the way, late March, um, then our box turtle friends are gonna start emerging again and they're gonna start roaming around looking for snacks after their long, uh, their long winter fast. Now, not all turtles are gonna be on land during this time. There are some turtles, like wood turtles, that are actually gonna go underneath the creek and underneath the mud, underneath the creek. Um, and they're gonna hunker down in the mud um, and that's where they're gonna overwinter during that time, um, which is pretty awesome. So these guys are gonna be able to survive the winter. Now it's really important that they do this because remember, reptiles are cold blooded. Now that doesn't mean that their blood is cold, right? It just means that for them, they can't generate their own body temperature. So for you guys at home, if you went outside today without a jacket home, right, without a jacket on, it is super cold. So you might start to shiver, right? And so for dude here, since he's cold blooded and not warm blooded like we are, he's not able to generate his own body temperature. So believe it or not, when you guys at home shiver, it's actually your muscles are, are generating heat in your body which is so cool. So even though you feel very cold, your body is working really hard to generate heat to make sure that you stay toasty warm. Now, dude, since he's unable to do that, that's why it's really important that he can hibernate or you know, um, slow his body down in the winter time to be able to survive. Now, again, come March, they'll come and they'll dig back out of the ground. They'll come up from the mud, right? For like a wood turtle once they, um, once the, the ice thaws and they'll come on out and it looks like dude here's starting to poke his hat out a little bit. I'm um, starting to see what's happening around here. Now for dude, since he lives here at the zoo, um, we maintain a steady temperature for him inside of our reptile room. So for, for dude, he actually doesn't need to fully brumate, unlike some wild turtles. So dude has been here with us at the zoo for many years now, he's in his 20s. Um, and dude here, since he maintains a, a steady temperature, he won't fully hibernate or brumate during this time. Um, and so that's one of the things that cues turtles in the wild, like box turtles, to actually begin to hibernate, is their, you know, their ability uh, to 
be able to really um, sense those shifts in temperature and the environmental shifts, which kind of lets them know in their head that it's time to go take a nice long winter nap. Now, that's one of the really important things about climate change, right, that we like to talk about is because with climate change, the earth is warming a little bit. So that's the kind of stuff that might confuse a turtle if it stays really warm into November and then gets really cold in December, right? They might not have those same cues to remember that it's time to hibernate. Um, so it could be, you know, dangerous for turtles later on if the world continues to warm up um, and we still have cold winters though, right? So um, all those things are important for turtles. Now, Dude here, for those of you who haven't met Dude before, um, he is, like I said, an eastern box turtle. So these guys are native to Pennsylvania, um, and they are omnivores, right? So they're going to be eating lots of bugs and insects and plant material. Dude here is a big fan of strawberries. And um, turtles, they don't have any teeth in their mouth, right? Specifically, Dude here, he only has a beak. So similar to a bird, right, he only has a beak for eating, no teeth in his mouth. Um, but that does just fine to help him eat up all kinds of food. And he does have a little nostril right on the end of his, um, right on the end of his beak there that allows him to still breathe and smell his food, right? So dude here, um, one of the ways that we can tell that he's a male box turtle or a boy box turtle is by the color of his eyes. So dude here actually has red eyes, um, and that lets us know that he is in fact a male turtle. So I'm gonna just pick him up a little bit so you guys can get a little bit of a better view. Um, so dude here is just hanging out to meet us today, coming out to see you guys. Um, and you can see that our friend dude here definitely does have those bright red eyes, and you can kind of see his beak um, hanging down a little bit over his mouth here. Now, being a box turtle means that these guys are able to entirely enclose their body inside of their shell. So what dude can do is he can tuck all his legs into his shell and he's able to kind of close up part of his shell, just like a door, um, in order to box himself up. So to give you a little bit of an idea, dude here, he has a hinge kind of on the bottom of his shell and that's going to allow him to close that part of his shell up so he can stay entirely boxed up inside of the shell and keep him nice and safe um, and a little bit warm, right? Extra layer of protection against the, the winter months. Now, dude here, he is born with this shell and he'll have it um, for the rest of his life. Um, so they don't go get new shells as they grow older. They'll continue to have the same shell and it'll just grow with him. So his shell is made out of bone, um, and as, as he grows, it'll grow with him. So to give you guys a little bit of an idea, I actually have some turtle shells here to show you. Um, so this here is from a snapping turtle shell, so you can see the obvious difference. Snapping turtles get much larger than box turtles. And dude is about fully grown for a box turtle. He really probably won't get much bigger than this. Um, but if you take a look at the inside of the snapping turtle shell, you'll be able to see that there are all these little bones kind of going right down the middle, and that's actually the spine. So you guys at home can probably feel your backbone if you reach behind you and try to feel your back. You can feel your backbone, and that means that we are vertebrates along with our friend Dude, right? Because he's got a backbone also. But if you look close, you can see that that backbone is attached to his shell, right? There's no way I didn't put this backbone on here, right? It came just like this. This was actually donated to us by a hiker going through the woods um, and thought it was a very cool teaching tool and brought it into us. Um, so you guys you can kind of see here that that backbone is attached to the inside of the shell. So dude here, his backbone is attached kind of right on the inside of his shell here um, underneath this. Now, the top of his shell is something that we call a carapace, um, and that is um, the top of his shell, and then the bottom of his shell we actually call a plastron. Um, so those are the two technical terms that we use when we talk about turtles. Now, I know you guys might be thinking that, well, I know that bones are white, right? And if you look at dude's back, you can see that his back is definitely not white, right? It's kind of a brown and black and a little bit of yellow, right? He's got a cool pattern on there. Um, and that's because his, his, his shell is covered in scales. And to give you guys a little bit of an idea of that, I actually have another um, great uh, shell here to show you. And you can see that there's the difference between kind of the white bone here and then these scales that are laying on top. So this is just another teaching tool, right? I didn't know this turtle. Um, but you guys can see here the difference between the white bone and those scales that are still on. Um, so these scales will eventually fall off of this, right? But um, you can see that these, uh, these scales are what we call scoots, and they help to protect 
that bone from damage, right? So whether it's scrapes or dudes climbing over some rocks, right? Those are all sorts of things that are going to allow him, um, you know, those those scoots are going to allow him to, to stay nice and safe from scratches. So that way his, his actual shell isn't damaged, um, which is really important. Now, um, today we're also going to be meeting another one of our box turtles here, um, and I am going to go ahead and, and get him out for you guys. Um, that way you can uh, get a good look at him. So I'm going to have um, my friend behind the camera just keep taking a look at dude here while I pull out um, our next friend. And this here is uh, Scooter. Um, and Scooter is actually a three-toed box turtle. Um, and I'm gonna show you guys a little bit of the difference between these two um, because they are pretty different. Um, so Dude here, like I said, is an Eastern box turtle, right? And Scooter is significantly smaller. Um, and he is a three-toed box turtle. Now these guys are some of the similarities between them, right, are they're both box turtles. So they both have that hinge kind of on the bottom of their plastron here that allows them to close up that shell. And they are both males, right, so they both do have those brightly colored eyes. Um, but that's about where the similarities end. Um, so for these guys, uh, they do um, live in different areas. So three-toed box turtles are called three-toed box turtles because they only have three toes on their back feet. Um, whereas dude here, he actually has, um, he has four on his back feet, um, which are kind of hard to see, but he's got four little toes on his back feet. Whereas our friend Scooter here does only have three. So I'm gonna go ahead and put dude back in his house and we can take a closer look at Scooter. Scooter. So Scooter here, he is a three-toed box turtle, right? Which means that he does in fact have those three toes. Um, but he is also from a different part of the United States than Dude is. So Dude is being an Eastern fox all up and down the East Coast, Midwest. And they also come from different kinds of habitats. So remember, Dude really loves um, forested habitats, but these guys, three-toed box turtles, actually come from marshier, kind of wetland, grassland environments. Um, so they live in a slightly different kind of habitat and they're gonna have different, you know, different environmental parameters. Um, but one of the main differences between Scooter and Dude, and you could see in their size difference, that Dude was much larger. Now, not all three-toed box turtles are as small as Scooter, and that's because Scooter here had something called metabolic bone disease. And that means that his bones were just not quite strong enough to support growing um, to his full capable size. Uh, Scooter is in his 20s, very much like Dude, and he should have probably been much larger, probably even double his size, but unfortunately, he didn't quite get the nutrients that he needed when he was growing to be able to get him to be uh, his full size. So Scooter here, unfortunately, he is not going to grow any larger than this. Um, now living at the zoo, um, he has a really great habitat, right? And we give him all the things that he needs, whether it's salads and nutrients and, and bugs and calcium. Um, but they also need something really important called UV rays. Um, so these guys need a special UV bulb um, to allow their bones to help grow. Um, and that allows him to, um, to keep those bones nice and healthy. So thankfully, um, although it affected his size, he still remains a pretty healthy turtle today. Um, and he's another one of our ambassador animals that comes out to meet people, which is pretty awesome. Um, so I'm not sure if we have any questions here today, but I want to make sure I get a chance to answer them. Um, so I'm going to let my friend uh, Margaret, who's behind the scenes today, she's uh, filming for me and she's going to ask me some of those questions and hopefully I can uh, answer them. So. Let's see what kinds of questions you guys had today. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments, um, and we'll be sure to try to answer as many as we can. So, Holly would like to know, does the continuous temperature mess up their inner clock? Oh, um, good question. So. Thankfully, it really doesn't. Um, so these guys are diurnal animals, so for them, it really um, allows them to um, 
you know, they're awake all day and then they go to bed at night. Um, and then in terms of hibernating, um, since we are able to continuously feed them and give them the right environmental parameters, um, they it doesn't totally mess them up too much. So for them, since they don't have to hibernate or brumate, remember they're doing that mostly because they can't generate heat, but also because there's no resources in winter time, right? A lot of times there's no bugs around, there's no fruits or berries, right? There's not a lot of food items for them to be roaming around and eating. So thankfully, um, these guys are, uh, since we are at the zoo, we're able to provide them for those resources that they wouldn't be able to get in the wild. So even though they don't, it doesn't um, trigger their hibernation, since they have a constant temperature, um, that's okay since these guys, we provide them with all the heat that they need and all the food. Awesome. Uh, Stacy and her daughter would like to know where turtles live. Oh, turtles live all over the world, which is so cool. Um, so turtles can live in the ocean or in the rivers. Um, they also live just like our box turtles live on land. But even we learned how dude, the box turtle likes to live in forests and Scooter here, he actually likes to live in marshy wetlands and even grassland areas. All right. Uh, another Holly would like to know, how does he go so long without food and water in the wintertime? Good stuff. So a lot of times food is a resource, right? And food, once an animal eats food, turns into energy, right? And that energy is used to kind of power our body around and allows us to, you know, be up and moving and running around and looking for food. Um, but for turtles, if they're not out and moving around and looking for food, they conserve a lot of that energy. So that means they really don't need to be able to go out and eat that food um, because they are, uh, they'll would, they would have eaten a lot of food come fall to really build up. Um, and then, and they're going to be able to, to kind of go several, uh, you know, to save that energy. Great question. You stay know it. Oh, that's actually illegal to have as pets in Pennsylvania. And that's because a few generations ago, a lot of people saw box turtles in their backyard and went, wow, these guys are really cool. I mean, obviously, look at how adorable Scooter is, right? Um, and, you know, they ended up taking them and keeping them in their homes. But the thing about box turtles is that they actually don't really reach maturity until about 10 years old. So what happens is it takes them so long to reach maturity to start laying eggs that unfortunately, if you pull them out of the wild, there's just not enough, um, not enough turtles out there to really be laying eggs. So unfortunately, a few generations ago, what happened was a lot of people ended up taking box turtles in as pets um, because it was, you know, definitely, it wasn't a big deal at the time, right? But unfortunately, we found that their population plummeted in the wild. Um, and so in order to, to protect turtles in the wild, um, Pennsylvania made it uh, a rule that you weren't allowed to have box turtles as pets. Now you can get other kinds of turtles as pets, um, but it's really important to do your research because turtles and tortoises can live an exceptionally long time. So even our turtles here, right, our box turtles, they are in their 20s right now, but the oldest living box turtle was 132. So they can live an enormously long time. So just like any animal, it's really important to, to do your research to, do com um, to make sure you understand the commitment of that animal that you're gonna adopt. It's a great question, guys. Hallie and Hazel would like to know what their shell is made out of. Oh, great question, Holly and Hazel. Um, thanks for asking. So again, their shell is made out of bone. And here's here's another great representation. You can kind of see this one is roughly the same size as our friend Scooter here. Um, so these are some of our teaching tools, right? And this here, and you can see that white bone, right? And then again, that bone is just covered in scales called scoots that allow it to be nice and protective. But his shell is in fact made out of bone. Great question. Stacy asked, what does a turtle sound like? <laughs> That's a good question. Believe it or not, some turtles actually hiss when they get mad. Um, so particularly box turtles, um, if they feel like they're, you know, if, if I surprise them or if they feel threatened or scared, um, what they do is they'll actually kind of go, ah, and they kind of hiss and then they'll pull their head in and all their legs um, and they'll kind of close up their shell, right? So um, other than that, they don't really make uh, too many other noises. I would say hissing is probably their number one noise that they make. That was the last question for now, but feel free to drop a question in the comments if you guys have any more. 
Yeah, guys, that's great. So, and don't forget um, that, you know, we uh, we got a lot of submissions early on when we first started to do school and into the spring about all your beautiful artistic renditions of some of our animals. Um, so if you guys, you know, ever feel inspired and want to draw some of our animals or paint some of our animals, um, we would, as always, love to see them and we always feature them on Zoo School Live. So be sure to uh, send them our way um, if you guys um, are feeling inspired by some of our animals and thanks again guys for joining us here on zoo school live and for sticking with us through some of the technical difficulties um, we're so excited to be back and we're so excited you guys are you know joining us and hopping on to check out zoo school live um, if you haven't seen zoo school live before I encourage you to go back and check out some of our previous episodes um, they're all available on YouTube you can check out our snowy owl one and um, even dudes very first appearance um, so thanks again guys from us here at the zoo and have a wonderful rest of your day.